an honor to be back before you today to give you an update on some of the things going on in Washington. Obviously, busy times. Many of the things going on there have impacts back home, so I wanted to lay those things out before you take your questions so that uh, you understand what's going on, or at least as much as I understand what's going on <laughs> with what's happening there in Washington. Let, let, me, let me start with talking about where we are with the issue that's most pressing, and that is finishing out this budget season. You know, in Washington, we unfortunately are using this process called continuing resolutions, which if you were to design a way not to run a government and not to run a business, a continuing resolution would be the way to do it. Temporary funding mechanisms without decisions being made, so we just go back to the previous appropriations bill and fund at that level, so it creates a lot of uncertainty. It is not the way to go about it. I was not in favor of the previous continuing resolution, nor am I in favor of one going forward. What I am hopeful that will happen is that the Senate will use the fiscal year 17 defense appropriations bill, which we have sent to the Senate, as the basis upon which to craft the rest of the appropriations bills around, because under the rule, all appropriations bills have to originate in the House, which this one has, so it's in the Senate. The Senate will be in for four days prior to the end of the continuing resolution, which is April 28th. The House will be in session for three days, so it makes sense that the Senate would put together what they see, send it back to the House. We would essentially have two days in order to act on that to make sure the government continues to be funded in a long-term perspective. The alternative to that is to adopt another continuing resolution. And whether a continuing resolution is short-term or long-term, it is tremendously problematic to our nation's military. The accounts that go to simple things like maintaining ships, maintaining aircraft, the dollars in those accounts are at zero. So if you fund at current levels going forward, there is no more additional money in the accounts because you can't start anything new. So if you're trying to bring a new ship to the shipyard, if you're trying to repair another aircraft, you just can't do that. So I think it's very problematic. I can tell you myself and a number of other members of the House Armed Services Committee are not in favor of another continuing resolution just because of the impact it has. For our region, it has a significant impact, too, because there are a lot of companies and individuals that do work to support our nation's military, as well as folks that travel every day from here to the Pentagon or to places like Quantico or Dahlgren or over to Fort A.P. Hill, whether they're in uniform or not. All of this has an impact on them. So. I am adamantly opposed to this mechanism going forward, so I just want to let you know that that's what we're going to be facing next week when we go back. Uh, nobody intends for there to be a government shutdown. That, that is not the way to go about this, but neither is having a continuing resolution. So I want to make sure that we get this done. We actually use the appropriations bills that on the House side have been through the full process, at least at the committee level, to get to either the Senate itself or to the House to get those, those things passed. So I'm hopeful that that will happen. Uh, and if it doesn't, then we'll be scrambling. And unfortunately, probably uh, the, the only other alternative to that is another short-term CR, which in itself has, has its own problems. When I say short-term, some people have talked about two weeks. But even two weeks cause cancellations of ship maintenance, cancellation of aircraft maintenance, and that just reverberates down the line. So you never catch that time back up. So it just, it's just not the way to go about doing things. So I want to let you all know because when we get back, you'll be hearing and seeing things about potentially what the alternatives are, which is a government shutdown, which is not anything that any of us are in favor of. But we want to make sure we're stable in how funding takes place. The second issue, too, coming up in this year's National Defense Authorization Act is the consideration of a Base Realignment and Closure Commission, better known as BRAC. Uh, there has been a little bit of a change. In years past, I have put language in the National Defense Authorization Act to authorize the service branches to do a current analysis of where they believe they are overcapitalized as far as base structure. I think we need an up-to-date study of that. What they've done in the past is to take the, the baseline 2005 study and do what they call a parametric analysis, which is just a, a fancy name to say that we're looking at it under today's terms, but making the assumptions we made back in 2005, which is not the way to go about that. I will say this. I believe that our bases in this region are well suited for whatever happens uh, with a consideration of the capitalization of these bases. But that being said, I do think that we need an analysis 
Uh, Senator McCain now has indicated an interest in going forward with that. I'm going to introduce the same language that I introduced the last two Congresses that say let's do an evaluation of the current situation, looking to at where the proper manning levels need to be. I think it needs to go back to the 2012 uh, in-force numbers. We're at a much lower level today. I don't think we're going to stay there. We're continuing to add numbers back to the Army, to the Marine Corps. Uh, we need to be reflective of that. Remember, too, if we take down bases, uh, if we close bases, especially in strategic areas, we'll never be able to reopen them because politically you're not going to be able to go back in and condemn that land again or take it away from the folks that, that you've given it to. And those bases are strategically located for a reason. So populations have grown around them. So we better think long and hard about how we do this, and I want to make sure we do it correctly. Another thing that we can do, too, is to look at what's happening on each individual base. Many bases have old buildings, very expensive to operate and very expensive to heat and cool. We ought to look at within bases allowing the military to take down those buildings to be able to reduce their cost and then those dollars can be put back into the into the military budget. So those are things that we're looking at. I'm hopeful that the language that I've suggested the last two years this time will make its way through which starts with an evaluation. That way everybody in the community will know what the assumptions are, the things that we are looking at with the capitalization that happens within, uh, within our military. So that, that's going to be upcoming. Another question, too, comes up uh, quite often about the what's called the skinny budget, the projected budget, the framework for 2018. There are some elements in there that I think are very problematic. One is significant reductions to the Chesapeake Bay program. For Virginia, I think it's extraordinarily important to make sure that there is a component there for coordination of Bay programs and the reason being is that we are downstream of all the other Bay states. If they don't do their job, guess who suffers? Virginia does. This truly is an issue of interstate commerce, so it's clearly a constitutional responsibility. I think those dollars need to be there to make sure we have that coordination so the folks that are talking about those things, that there is, uh, there's an element of how we make those things happen. The EPA, for things I disagree with them on, I do agree with what's happening with the Bay program and how things are going there. So I've been very adamant about making sure those dollars get back. I've just recently put together a letter to send to the president, the second one, saying that the Bay is an economic engine. Let's consider it as a job creator. So as we put these dollars here, it really is an economic investment to make sure water quality improves, which assures that the Bay is actually potentially going to produce more, which is, a, I think, a great asset to Virginia. So. We're going to be doing those things. There are other elements of the budget, too, that really beg for us to have a debate about that. Things like uh, Meals on Wheels. I was just at the Area Agency on Aging today to talk to them about the impact on some of those areas of the budget. You know, what we can do to help seniors to make sure we, they stay in homes, to make sure they have contact there. That helps us, in the long run, reduce cost in other areas of government, especially places like both Medicaid and Medicare. So those are issues that I will be taking up. If you see things in the skinny budget that are going to impact Stafford County, please let me know because I want to make sure that we reflect what the impact is going to be on folks back home as well as counties because we know that you know, all of this impact comes downhill both to state budgets and to local budgets. And when those things are important to communities, what happens is people say, well, if the federal dollars disappear, who do they look to? I've been in your seat before. They look right there to say, you know, what, what's going to happen here at the local level. So those are some of the things I think are that are of immediate impact here that I, I want, wanted to make sure I had the opportunity to let the board know about so that you could hear it directly from me, that you could let me know the things that you need for me to be working on, the reflection that you want to be cast in Washington from your perspective about what we need to be doing. So, Mr. Chairman, I've talked long enough. I'll turn it back to you and, uh, and take any questions or comments that you all may have for me. I'm sure we have several. I know I have a couple. Um, Oh. Well, I'll start with the. Right? Yeah. No. Yes. We'll let, yes. we'll let, we'll yeah. let Wendy start. Um, and now that we have a Republican House, Senate, and President, are we going to get back to a regular order where we have budgets that are on time? The continuing resolutions are very devastating for yeah. Stafford County for a number of reasons. Number one, it's act it's physically impossible for your contracting officers to execute on the contracting actions in, in the three months' time that you guys give them with the continuing resolutions. Additionally, our businesses are unable to to basically do long year long term leases yeah. because there is so much uncertainty within the federal mm -hmm. government. 
Is there any plan to get back to um, budgeting on it, at least not extend these continuing resolutions um, well into the fiscal year? Well, Wendy, I have been hollering and screaming at the loudest pitch that I can to emphasize how important that is. I think that Congress needs to stay in Washington through this archaic process called August recess to actually get those appropriations bills done. We're going to get pushed this year with the budget. So I want to make sure that we are using every minute of the time to get appropriations bills done. Because if we don't, if we go home for the five week quote unquote August recess, we come back with essentially 13 legislating days left before the end of the fiscal year. And we know what's going to happen another CR to kick the can down the road. And you're exactly right. The folks within the Pentagon can't plan. The contractors that have work also can't plan. Many times the work they're doing, the payments get held up because people don't know what's going to happen after the continuing resolution. They don't know if those programs are going to continue. So it creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty and inefficiency. And the money we have to spend to catch up is wasted money. So I, I couldn't agree more. We have to get back to regular order. I've been pretty emphatic about that. I've asked the speaker now, well ahead of time, to say, with all the things we have to do and with time being compressed, they ought to stay in Washington in, excuse me, in August until the job gets done. I think that's incumbent upon us to do that. So you'll find that I'll continue to be in the speaker's ear asking us to stay. Thank you. Who's next? So uh, I would agree with you. If you don't get your job done, you should have to stay in Washington. I agree. Uh, I think it's probably easy for you to say you live down the street. But, um, <laughs> but if you don't get your job done, I don't get to go home. So uh, right. I agree with that. So when you talk about the skinny budget, something that, that does impact not just Stafford County, but um, a lot of businesses in general, is things have been cut from the Small Business um, Administration, yeah. uh, specifically impacting our 8A companies. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, our, our 8A companies, several folks know what that is, but there are our minority owned, there are yes. veteran owned. Um, they also incorporate some of our Native Alaskans, Native tribes, and our Native Hawaiians. Yes. Um, those programs are on the chopping block right now. And um, what happens with these super 8As, as we call them, I represent outside of here a Hawaiian owned mm -hmm. company is we, we hire folks at a higher rate because we can't, we are not for profit, all of them are. So mm -hmm. we give back to the community higher, we give higher salaries, better benefits. When those programs are cut and you impact the 8A programs, um, it takes away from the community. And so I would really strongly advocate, and I'd love to sit down with you outside yeah. of here and talk to yeah. you about all the great things that the 8A programs are doing, but specifically those super 8A programs and why it is good to. Um, invest in those. Um, and I don't know if was you want me to question? ask. Only. Yeah. Well, it was well a no, I, I make a comment on that, Laura. <laughs> that's, I think that's, that's, that's very insightful because what we find is throughout Stafford County and other areas, in, in those companies, in order to get off the ground, need the ability to have access to that work. If we ever expect to make sure that, that those small companies get to grow to be medium and larger size companies, the ability for them to be able to have access to that work, because many times, you know, it's very tough to break in. But once, you, once you're able to break in, uh, then we find these companies do some pretty spectacular work. So I, I want to make sure that those folks still have the access. And access is, is key. Small Business Administration does a really good job about cultivating those small businesses, trying to find opportunities for them. Uh, the small business innovation grants, too, that go there for a company to take a concept and to grow it and then go from phase one to phase two, ultimately to phase three in production is also an important part of what we have seen happens with our nation's innovation and creation to get neat things to the market and get it there pretty quickly. We work with a number of those companies that have done those things, have started out as a, under an SBIR concept and have gone through phase one and phase two and then all of a sudden go to phase three and find themselves in a very successful position. And much of the innovation we enjoy both in the application of technology to the military, but also in other areas of the government have come from that small business administration program. So I agree, we need to look very, very carefully at that. We can give you talking points if you need them. There you go. <laughs> um, but uh, so a, to, a couple of questions that I do have is, mm -hmm. we look in the area and we have more military, more veterans than, than uh, much of the, the nation. Mm -hmm. we, we lack a, veteran, a VA, yeah. a VA hospital. and. Uh, 
you know, what's going to happen? Is there any way that we could even broach the subject of getting a VA hospital in Stafford um, to where folks have access to the services they need um, in this area? I certainly think we can. You know, we're blessed to have two satellite clinics that operate from Hunter Holmes McGuire Clinic in Richmond, one in Spotsylvania, one in Stafford. Uh, they're great, but they can only take up so much of the demand here. Many folks have to go to Fort Belvoir or sometimes even into Washington to be able to get those services. I certainly think the demand is here for us to be able to do that. As you know, they are building a VA facility that initially will be state funded over in Prince William County. Mm -hmm. So there'll be another access point there. I think it's, it's prudent for us to be able to talk with the folks in the General Assembly who are fronting that money to build a facility there in Prince William County with the idea that at some point the VA will pay that back in order to have that facility there. I think it'd be a great opportunity to talk about maybe what we could do in the Stafford County area because there's a significant amount of population that's going to be served by the Prince William facility and there's a significant amount of demand here that's still going to exist. So people that are going to the clinics here, I don't think they're going to travel over to Prince William County. I still think they're going to be seen here. And you could take those two facilities and combine them into one and at least have a larger facility that has more specialists there. As you know, they're limited in what they can do here to mostly general practice. There are a few specialties, but a lot of times you've got to travel to Richmond or to other areas to get the, the advanced treatment that, that you need. So I'm glad to continue to broach that with the Veterans Administration to look at what they're looking at as far as their capital improvement plan. Well, and Belvoir may not be a perfect solution because under TRICARE now, everybody with TRICARE has to go up to Belvoir. Yeah. You can yeah. no longer use your own private doctors down here, mm -hmm. uh, which did not go over very well with That's the, right. with the yes. retired yeah. spouses specifically. Yes. So, you know, to say that we'll just send them all to Belvoir, you know, Belvoir is a beautiful facility. It has a ton of room, but is it really going to be able to support no, I agree. all the and folks that we have? It, it, and it won't. And if you look under the Choice Act, which says that if you are more than 40 miles away by, the, by road, not by the way the crow flies, by road to a facility, or it takes you more than 30 days to get an appointment, you have the ability to go see a private doctor. Unfortunately, the choice plan isn't working like it was designed to because many times the VA turns away folks that would use uh, the choice plan. And you're right, for people to have to travel from here to Belvoir, while it may seem okay on the road, we know what the traffic is like, and it can take hours sometimes to be able to get there. So that is not an element of convenience, and we've had that discussion with the folks in the VA to talk about access here. That's one of the reasons they put the clinic over in Spotsylvania, but I still believe the demand, because I talk to veterans that say, you know, Rob, I would love to be able to, to get more appointments at Stafford or Spotsylvania, but they can't get it because there aren't specialists there, there aren't the full scope of services that they would need at those facilities. So they have to get in the car and travel significant distances, and they still can't use the choice card like they would like to be able to use the choice card. I have more, but I'll let somebody else. Sure. Um, Congressman, as you know, transportation is our biggest issue in this yes. region. Yes. Um, I know your experiences as you drive around and when you're coming up and down 95. As you know, from the Atlantic Gateway Project, we were successful there. I'm sure you're instrumental in helping us with a lot of that. But at our FAMPO meeting last night, you know, we did not fare well in our smart scale from this last round, and now we've got to wait another two years. And Hampton Roads and Northern Virginia both have the transportation authorities, and we don't have any match money in Stafford. Yeah. But yet this part of the interstate affects from Maine to Florida. Yeah. And we just feel very hamstrung, and I'm not sure that the FAMPO board wants to do a transportation authority. It's an additional tax. Yeah. So I don't know, what do you have any... And can you help us in, because, you know, now that gas tax prices have come down, our gas tax money is gone. I mean, a lot of people on this mm -hmm. board have improved roads long before I came along on this yeah. board, but that money is, is gone. Yeah. Well, Meg, I, I agree. For this region, it's extraordinarily important. As you know, we were able to get some of the uh, America Gateway money for the Virginia Gateway, the improvements for I-95. I don't think it goes far enough south. You know, it's supposed to stop at the Route 3 exit. I've talked to Secretary Lane. I think it needs to go all the way down to Massaponics because that's the only place where traffic begins to thin out. There's some dollars there, too, for the third rail and the Long Bridge improvement. But another element, too, is the time it takes for those projects to go from design to construction to completion. Uh, we've got to do things to be able to truncate that process. There's a lot of duplication at the state and federal levels. We ought to be able to design a project from concept 
to actual beginning of awarding of bids in, in 12 months or less. There's no reason why, why we can't do that. So that, I think, would be a help. You talk about resources. You're right. In the lower end of the district, I have uh, the localities that are going through the improvements on Interstate 64. They are using their regional authority dollars to match there in the competition there, as you know, under, um, under House Bill 2, HB 2, it does provide some leverage as far as competition for those projects in, the, in those regions. One of the things we've looked at at the federal level is for us under the transportation bill, which will come up not this year, but for reauthorization again next year, is to make sure that we stop Virginia from being a donor state. We still, for every dollar we send to Washington, we still only get 98 cents back on the dollar. So if we could actually leverage a few more dollars, and I argue that much of the impact that we experience here in this region is due almost exclusively to Washington, because you combine the transient traffic along with people going back and forth uh, to the Pentagon, to D.C., that creates the issue that we find ourselves in here. So I think the federal government ought to have a larger role in providing the dollars there. So we'll continue to look for ways to be able to advocate for those dollars. We've been able to advocate for those projects and get those dollars allocated. The difficulty, the thing that took me back a little bit that you pointed to was, you know, once we secured those dollars for what we said would be those projects, then the Commonwealth Transportation Board says, oh, by the way, you need to get back in and compete for those dollars. And we thought that we had already done that in proposing dollars be spent on projects in the area. So it is a little frustrating to see us have to have to recompete for those. I want to make sure that I think I think the demand and the need is clearly here. I think all you have to do is to experience this traffic like I do coming down the road and like everybody else here does to understand, you know, where the priorities need to be. So if there are other things that we can do uh, there in Washington, I want to make sure that that we're doing that and advocating for uh, for transportation funding in this in this corridor. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Bob. Thanks for coming, Congressman. Appreciate Thanks, it. Bob. Thank you. Um, as you know, uh, the base military budget is obviously very important um, to the national defense of the country. Um, I was on active duty 9-11 when all of a sudden we started getting contingency funding to yeah. take the fight to the enemy. Um, and we've been getting that every single year. Yeah. And my fear is that that has really become part of what should maybe be the base budget. Yes. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and if you think the base plus the contingency might make it into the next budget somehow. Well, I sure hope so. The, the skinny budget, as it's proposed, proposes to increase the base budget, which, as you said, should have been done all along. We have now been funding base mission, that is readiness mission, through contingency funding now for 16 years. In my book, it's no longer a contingency if you've been doing it for 16 years. So, and you don't have consistent sources of funding, so now you have to rely each year to make the arguments to get money into the Overseas Contingency Operation Fund to fund base mission. And, and you can't do that if you want to have a long-term vision about recapitalizing, modernizing aircraft, building new aircraft, maintaining ships, building new ships, doing the things we need to do, not just to, to properly train, but to do operation and maintenance functions and to modernize. And I argue today modernization is as important as it's, as it's ever been. So making sure that this year we get back to actually having a base budget that is at least at 603 billion dollars. I think it should be more, but 603 is a lot better than where we've been in the past. Uh, on that side, you can add some contingency dollars to that and maybe get back up to actually where we were uh, last year. Uh, but, but there are things I think that we can do additionally to get us on track. We have to build more ships. I think it's critical for what we need in projecting forces forward of three uh, evaluations, one done by the Navy, two independent evaluations. All of them said at a minimum we need 355 ships in our Navy. Today we only have 274. They've all said, too, that in some form or another we need to have at least 12 carrier strike groups to make sure we're out there. Remember, too, the thing we need to talk about is it's not just about building new ships, it's about maintaining the ships that we have. It's about supporting the Marines and sailors that are on board those ships. So what's called the tail, that is the additional cost that go along with building those ships, is also an important part of what we need to do. Let me speak about one other thing also that I think is critical that doesn't get mentioned these days. We hear in the headlines every day about the strategic risk that this nation faces. We hear about terrorism. We hear about China. We hear about Russia. We hear about Iran. We hear about North Korea. One thing we don't hear about that I think is as important for us to consider 
is the challenges for us today are time and resources because we haven't used time well our adversaries have caught up with us and when it takes us 20 years to field a major weapon system that's entirely too long and our, our adversaries can do that in a quarter of the time if we're going to catch up and make sure we maintain the ability to strategically stay in front of our adversaries we have got to use time to our advantage so we've got to do better in how we field technology get it to the warfighter more quickly you know our adversaries start with a blank sheet of paper we start with a sheet of paper that has a bunch of no's on it no you can't do this no you can't do that and then you have to find portals through that page of paper to say well how can i do this that puts us at a disadvantage secondly is resources it used to be in the past, you said, don't worry about it. If we need something, guess what? We just throw a bunch of money at it. We don't have a bunch of money anymore. We have $20 trillion of debt. We have a $600 billion deficit this year. If we're going to be where we need to be, we need to do a better job with every dollar that we have than our adversaries do. And we can do that. We have the innovation and creation to do that. We've got to do things in a shorter period of time. We have to make sure we deliver everything on time or beforehand. We have to make sure that we are are judicious with budgets to make sure we deliver things on budget I argue even under budget and for every dollar we spend we better do a better job at spending that dollar and getting more out of it than our adversaries because if we don't we're gonna find ourselves in a position that's not of our liking so I think those are things that I've been emphasizing and it goes right to your point about making sure that you know we look at the long-term base budgeting and make sure we get the most out of the dollars we put there. We can't do things by contingency funding anymore and expect to have what we need in our military. And, uh, and that affects our region too. You know, contingency funding creates uncertainty here in this region, so and we can't have that. Right. You kind of touched on my second question. Um, mm -hmm. We saw in the news we're you know, sending a uh, carrier strike group mm -hmm. to the Western Pacific, and I think many people wonder, with all the continuing resolutions we've had, and we know that means not a lot of maintenance is being done, you know, what the health of the current fleet is, but do you think our shipbuilding industry here in America can, can get us up to the over 300 ships we need? Well, I think it can. I think it can, Bob. The, the key for us is the ramp speed. And we've asked the Congressional Budget Office as well as others to give us a scenario about how we ramp the industry up because there are skills in the industry that you can't press the button and have today. I argue it takes at least five years to take a shipbuilder that comes in the door and get them totally proficient in the skill that they have to have in building those ships. And you know, building ships is not a short-term process. You know, for carriers now, we're building them on six-year centers. We're going to look to accelerate the building programs there, but we don't want to do it faster than what the industry can provide as far as skilled labor. We don't want to do it faster than where they can efficiently use resources. We've seen that in the past where you throw a bunch of money in, more money than what the industry can actually absorb and use efficiently, and then we hear the horror stories afterwards about money that's wasted. So I'm going to make sure that we are specific as to the ramp speed as to how we get to 355 ships, and I've asked both the yards and the Congressional Budget Office to tell us what they can accomplish, how they can build the ships we need, and how they can do that within certain budget constraints. So we'll hear back from them, and as we make the decision this year in the NDAA, it will be based on on real-world scenarios about what we can accomplish, and we're going to get there at the right ramp speed to make sure we're, we don't get out in front of the industry to make sure we can actually build these ships on time and on budget. Good. Um, last question is um, surrounding the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, I know there was a lot of pressure to just repeal it and pass something as a base, and we'll come back and fix it later. Mm -hmm. But I think we saw the first time around the Democrats did that, and they were never able to, you know, get the 60 votes to to make it better. So mm -hmm. we're we basically are stuck with what we have. I'm just kind of curious on your thoughts on if we should pass something and try to fix it or wait for the right bill to come around. Well, I, I think there's a difference between doing something and doing the right thing. I think we have to do the right thing. I think the complexities in looking at how we reduce costs for premiums has to be job one. If all we're going to do is to change the title of the bill and we're still going to have increasing premiums, that doesn't get to where we need to be. And that's not the expectation that the American people have for us to fix things. Also, to make sure that there are choices there so people can balance how they look at health care with what they can afford in their family budgets, that has to be a part of it. I think there are a lot of things that weren't included in this bill that can make it better. I've been talking with leadership and others from folks all across the spectrum in Washington about what we can do to make the bill better. I am hopeful that we don't bring another bill to the floor to address this until we have the right elements put together to make sure we indeed have a solution that makes things better, that brings down costs for individuals, 
and truly fixes the system. I think there's some simple fixes there. We never even ask the Senate parliamentarian about what could be done under reconciliation. Why don't we ask those questions about what can be included in that bill? Much of what was put in the bill was passed under reconciliation. If you're going to change things under the bill, it seems like to me you ought to be able to use the same process. So we're having those discussions right now. The good thing is the Speaker has said he's not going to be driven by time, which I think is correct. We're going to be driven by making sure we're doing the right thing and getting it done properly. We do have some time restrictions as far as what we can do to use the fiscal year 17 reconciliation process. I think that's probably until the end of June. But the way I feel about it is we don't have a bill that we all believe in and that will indeed reduce premium costs for folks in the near term. It, it may not be this year because the actuarial tables are already being formed for this year, but it has to be at least, I think, in the following year to be able to do that. If we don't have that, I don't think we ought to be pressed by time. I think we ought to say, okay, we had our chance with that. Let's do other things. Let's come back to that and make sure that we get it right. Uh, th there are going to be issues that we're going to have to deal with this year with some of the exchanges, but I think that those things can be dealt with administratively by Secretary Price. So that's, that's, that's where I think we are right now. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the sure. update. Thanks, Bob. How about down on this end of the dais? Mr. Snellings? Mr. Cavalier? Congressman, I just wanted to say thank you for all you do and how, you, for being so accessible and visible out here always at all our events, particularly here in Stafford. I know it's thank a big you. district, so appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jack. I appreciate uh, everyone's service on the board. I know that this is truly where the rubber hits the road. My wife used to tell me when I was on the Board of Supervisors in Westmoreland County, she said, Honey, if you're going with me to the grocery store, we've got to leave an hour early. Because <laughs> she knew what we would face there. So I appreciate what you all do. You all are out there, too, and, and really representing the county well. And I just want to make sure I know what I can do to either help or get out of the way. Sometimes the best thing we can do in Washington is get out of the way and make sure that you all continue to do the great things that you're doing here. So. Speaking of that, yeah. um, our president wants to make some pretty sweeping tax reforms. What, mm -hmm. what, what, what's your, what is your feeling? What, are the, what kind of taxes would you support uh, eliminating or reducing? Sure. And how do you feel about that overall uh, prospect? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I think we need to have both tax reform for individuals and on the corporate level. One of the things I think we can do pretty easily is to change the repatriation tax, which is the tax companies have to pay to bring their dollars from overseas operations back to the United States. They have to pay the difference in the tax rate in that country where they earn the money to the corporate tax rate here. Uh, that keeps a lot of money overseas. If we bring that back by reducing the rate on that, I think we could get a significant number of dollars back in tax revenue. I think it would be great to take that money and devote it towards infrastructure. It'd be a great influx of money so that states that have projects ready to go can put those right out there and get things done. It would certainly be a big help to this region. I think you can do things on the corporate uh, tax side to look at loopholes and exemptions, but also to look at where the corporate tax rate is. We are the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Uh, by most measures. Some say we're second, but, you know, first or second highest, you know, it's, it's really all, all relative. It's not a place where we want to be. The median tax rate around the world is about 24 percent. I'd like to see us bring the corporate tax rate down to at least the median. I think we need to bring it down below that in order for us to be competitive. So that's one of the areas where I think we can find some agreement. The same on the individual uh, tax side. I think making sure that we have tax relief for middle class families, especially in those middle income brackets, is a great way to go to, to get that tax bracket around the 15 percent level I think think would be great to look to to make sure we have the right balance of, of, of uh, deductions I think keeping things like the mortgage interest deduction the charitable giving deduction the dependent deduction are all things that are critical but you have to be able to simplify the tax code at the same time too. 70,000 pages of tax code I think is more than what anybody can realistically expect to understand and to implement I think we can do that. Now, that's asking an awful lot to be able to do because there are a lot of different ideas out there and a lot of external groups are going to weigh in about what they like and, and what they don't like. But I think we have the opportunity to do that. I think it's critical that we get corporate tax reform done, especially for small businesses. And you, and you can't do that without reforming the individual tax code because for many small businesses, they operate as S corporations, which means their income is passed through. So while they run a business, their income shows up on their personal income tax form. So if you just do 
corporate tax reform, you don't impact those individuals that own those small businesses. So I believe that you have to do both. And I think there's some good proposals out there that can pass and can, can get done this year. Now, I don't know time-wise where things are in the, in the process because we're kind of getting pushed with where we are in getting this current budget done with the CR and those things. But I certainly think there's no reason, if we stay in town in August, for us to be able to get it done by the end of August. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, Sellers, I, we're, we're, we're up against, we're about 40 yeah. minutes into, your, into our meeting, and it's been yours so far. I don't want sure. to keep you here too Well, long. listen, no, I, my, my time is yours. So I know you all have a schedule. I don't want to keep you all here late, but I want to make sure I'm here to answer your questions. I'm sure we could go, keep at this for quite a while if we wanted yeah. to, Lauren. Let's, let's make this our last round. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, um, in, in addition to doing intelligence work, I'm, I'm a clinically trained social worker. Mm -hmm. So near and dear, all my clinical work is in with severely mentally ill and typically homeless. Uh, one of the programs that you talked to us about several months ago, maybe a year now, over at Brook Point High School was some opiates yes. uh, type stuff. Yeah. Um, do you have any updates on that? I do have two other questions, but yeah. an update on that because you held the big town hall on that. There are, you know, the opioid abuse bill that passed at the end of the last Congress uh, laid out ability for those dollars to come back to localities for uh, for education programs, for substance abuse treatments, uh, for dollars for law enforcement departments to do simple things like, um, uh, like the educating their, their officers uh, to be able to use uh, the Narcan kits. Uh, and I'm glad to make sure we get you some more information because the agencies have now rolled out the requirements for counties to actually apply for those dollars and there's some competitive grants out there where you can apply for those dollars and actually get them for programs at the county level. Uh, we've seen too in this region uh, the charts and you actually see opioid abuse here a little bit above the state average so you wouldn't think that but we do have uh, issues in the region so Laura I'd love to sit down with you I'll make sure that that we go through where the agencies are now to give you the details about how uh, the county or the folks that you work for can access those dollars, how they're being put out there with these uh, requests for proposals. So I'll make sure we get you, get you those details. Okay, perfect. Sure. And then uh, you mentioned a little bit about housing programs. You mm -hmm. know, the housing programs have not been reformed in several, probably decades. Yes. You know, and what happens um, is, is you have several ways of approaching housing mm -hmm. issues. Um, and what we tend to do in the federal government, what you guys tend to do is you go from one extreme to another, and that mm -hmm. really impacts local governments. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't matter what programs are out there. Whether we have any or none, we have to, we have to help folks. Sure. Um, and one of the things that uh, I've, I've heard about and that I look mm -hmm. at often is the voucher system. Yes. You know, the voucher system work, works much better than these tax um, incentivized apartment complexes, we know that those are not the way to go. Right. Unfortunately, right now, the voucher system is broken. Mm -hmm. The voucher yeah. system allows people to actually provide the vouchers to people, you know, in their wills to next yes. generations. Yeah. Yeah. And so my question is, at what point do we start looking at these programs, not taking money away from these programs, because yeah. they do help people, sure. but how do we actually look at this and reform these programs um, to and so that local governments in the region really can start better accessing them. Well, well, Laura, I think those are great points. You know, I've heard a lot from folks in the Section 8 voucher program to understand how do we make sure we get those to folks within particular communities? Because, you know, there may be somebody that lives in Stafford today that decides tomorrow they're going to go elsewhere. Uh, but the need still exists here because you may have a whole backlog of folks that are, that are competing for those vouchers. And that person leaves and they actually get to take the voucher with them. So it doesn't reflect the needs in, in, in regions of the country. I think we need to be looking at that and figure out, is there a better way to do that? As you said, the vouchers, too, can be passed on in a will. So the question is, is how do you assess need and to make sure that the dollars are going where the true need is? And when you have a community that has an inordinate issue with lack of affordable housing and to make sure you have those dollars there, how do we make best use of the dollars that we have? Because the only way that many times in communities that you can meet the need is to look at expanding the number of vouchers and you know with the federal budget limitations we have at the federal level I just don't see that expanding significantly in, in any way in, in the near future so the question is is how do we use the dollars that we have in better ways as you said not to not to take them away but to look at how do we make sure we get those dollars where they need to be I think there's an opportunity too for localities to say listen we have some 
programs here where we work with the different agencies about where people are placed, where we focus on affordable housing, whether it's through a zoning ordinance or through development, to make sure you have that, that proper mix. So, you know, I'd love to get your ideas and other board members' ideas on what we need to do uh, with, those, with those particular programs. I think with anything in human and social services, and I say mm -hmm. this often, um, yeah. Uh, in several of the committees is we have to make sure that we're not just feeling good about what we're doing yes. that we're actually doing good and so if somebody's having to rely on the federal government or the local government for their entire lives mm -hmm. we failed them yeah we have failed them and so you know if, if we could start thinking differently at all levels of government but starting in Congress because that's where the big programs start from mm -hmm. and 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 writing public policy that actually helps people mm -hmm. and, that, and supports them when they need it, but then helps them to get off those programs. Because right. we don't ever want people to just be consistently mm -hmm. on those programs. And then it, then it impacts us. All sure. of our service costs go up. So, um, yeah, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your thoughts yeah. on it and then invite you kind of to the regional sure. discussions about what we're doing and ways that we can better work uh, with the feds. So we're going to, that's going to be the end of this yeah. town, our, our county hall for yeah. you. Yeah. Um, well, Laura, I'd lo lo love to work with you on that, so we, we can do that. So, yep. And next time you come, we'll have a more, whole new set of questions. We'll gotcha. so be prepared for things about comprehensive immigration reform and, <laughs> yes. and things like that. It could go on forever. Well, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be the next chapter. There's a lot of things on our, on our plate this year to be able to address. And, and please let me know as time goes on. If you hear things that you want more information on, if you want to make sure that your perspective gets to the discussion in Washington, please let me know because I, I can tell you, the most compelling arguments that we can make is to tell your stories of what you have to deal with here at the local level, because I think that's the most compelling way for us to affect how the debate takes place in Washington, to have an impact, to understand how do decisions in Washington affect things at the local level? How do they affect people's lives? It's easy to get very generic and, and to get sometimes overly partisan about things, but the question then becomes, how do we affect people's lives and how do we make sure we reflect on the full spectrum? So not just the program itself, but how efficiently are we running the program? What are the dollars that we have? How do we make the priority decisions about where those dollars go? How do we keep in mind managing a deficit, managing a debt, managing things like maintaining our military? All those things are very, very complex, but having your perspective about how we set those priorities to me is very helpful because you have to set them every year in your budget things happen a little bit differently in Washington. So I want to make sure we're reflective of how you see the priorities. So when we make decisions in Washington, it at least in some way is connected with reality. Yeah, well, you've been an excellent representative for this region for the, and it's great to have a person who's come up through local government. Mm -hmm. We certainly know that you understand exactly what we're faced with here. So um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, board members, thanks again. Look forward to continuing the conversations. Please stay in touch, whatever we can do, we look forward to it.